All right, welcome back to our second session on our Altium journey. So last time we left off with this schematic here, and we're gonna basically take it right from where we left off, and we're gonna start by creating a printed circuit board. So I already have my printed circuit board added here in my design, as well as I have the, the libraries that I've been pulling parts from. So let's go ahead and add these parts to a printed circuit board. So I'm gonna do that by going to design and then selecting update PCB document. In this case, it's PCB document main demo two, which is the name of this PCB here. And I'm gonna get prompted with this engineering change order here. So I'm gonna get told everything it's gonna do. So let's just take a look what's going on in this menu. So these are all the components that are being added as, long, as well as with their designators. And then these are all the nets that are also being added. So the net is the names given to the traces. So you can also name these nets. So let's just do that and see how this change occurs. So I'm gonna add this, then we're gonna rename a net, and then I'm gonna update the printed circuit board. So I don't need the room for this design, so we're just gonna not add that to the, to the actual printed circuit board. So let's quickly do a validate. Yeah, it looks like everything should work out. And then we'll execute to actually make those changes occur. And then just like last time, here are my parts on my printed circuit board. So we'll come back to this in one moment. Let's just take a look at how this will change if I add a net. So quite often we name nets so that we have more information. For instance, I might wanna call this net here um, red and green LED. So if I just take this line and double click on it, I now have the ability here um, to modify the parameters of it. So for instance, I can add information here, like the name uh, for this parameter. I can also right click on the net here, and I can also modify um, information about the net as well. So, Ah, sorry, you need to go up to place to add net label. You can't just directly change it. So this has been updated in this version of Altium. So I can place these two net labels on these two lines now. And now I can modify this net label. So I'm going to call this red LED. And we'll call this green LED. Now I could have some further information as well. Like I could uh, label these nets going in and out of say my voltage regulator here if I wanted to better prioritize or name the, the uh, nets in this design. But let's start with that for now. So first things first, I need to save this if I actually want the changes to take effect because Altium does not push any changes unless it's been saved. And I'm gonna go update PCB document. And here we go, it's changing those two nets to these two parts. So you can't physically see it here, but if we go to the output, you see how this now says red LED and the other one will say green LED. Those are the changes that occurred as well as the other corresponding nets that they connect to. So the next step in our printed circuit board design is let's actually define the shape of this board. So if I'm working with another piece of CAD software like Fusion 360, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, I could import a board shape into here to define my outline. That could be a 3D body, it could be a 2D drawing. But let's just say I'm just going to define my body directly in Altium. So I'll come down here and let's go. So I need to change the layer. I'm going to change my layer to the board layer. And let's place a rectangle. So since this is going to be a logic probe, let's do a nice little skinny uh, design here. And then I go up here and go to board shape. Now, since I've already selected this rectangle here, so if I click on it, you can see it's now highlighted. And if I go up here to design to board shape, I'm going to define board shape 
um, from selected objects. And there we go. That is now the new board shape that I have. So let's go about actually printing, placing some components. So here, if you see these wire bands, these white lines here, those are the proposed connections that have to occur based on our schematic. So J1 here is my connector, and then these are the following components. Now, one thing you'll notice here is I have a number of parts that are connected between five volts and ground, right? So if we go through our parts here and take a look, I have a number of parts that are connected to five volts and ground. I have C1 and C3 here, but I don't know where they're supposed to go. So these capacitors are going to be my coupling and decoupling caps. Now, if we take a look at my schematic diagram here, uh, we can see that C3 is the bulk capacitor on the output of my regulator, and that C1 is the input decoupling cap for my op amp. So that means that C1 should be physically close to my uh, op amp, and C3 should be physically close to my regulator. So I'm going to want C3 here close to the output of my regulator, and I'm going to want C2 close to the input because that's the input bulk capacitor. So I might start doing an initial layout like this, trying to uh, line up these uh, bands for the routes um, well in my design. So now these parts here are all connected to the output of my op amp. And U1 here is my actual um, op amp device. So part of this is just going through and taking a look at how we can best arrange these parts to eliminate the wire routes. And what typically ends up happening is you do a design and then you end up redoing the design once you start routing it because you find uh, how to optimize the, the layout. So quite often when you're doing this, there's no good way to set up the routes ahead of time. You're never going to get it perfect on the first try. You'll end up having to do routes and then seeing small portions of the design that you can optimize and then improve upon. So let's start routing this. So one of the first things I'm going to want to do in this design before I actually start routing, which I should have done even before placing or bringing in any components, is I should have went up to the design here and I should just open up this rule section. Now for the rules that I have in here, they need to match the rules for my manufacturer. So I should go to JLC PCB because that's the service they're going to use. And if we bring up their website and take a look, what I'm going to want to look at is their resource section or their capability section. So in here, it's going to provide me the capabilities of how they can build their boards. And then specifically what I'm going to want to look at is I'm going to want to look at things like drill hole sizing. So in here, I'm going to want to go through this list and underneath, um, uh, manufacturing here, there's a number of things I'm going to need to specify. And then same thing here for routing, there's a number of things I have to specify. So under the drill hole sizes, I'm going to have to go through and specify these. 
I'm going to have to go through and, and specify the minimum clearances and the minimum annular rings. So depending on the thickness of copper, these also change. And PTH stands for plated through hole. So again, these values change depending on the thickness of copper. In general, most boards we get made are one ounce. You, for a premium, you can get two ounces made. So this is the thickness of copper that's on the actual outside of the printed circuit boards. So my first step is going through these and then making sure my rules here match JLC PCB. So for instance, here in the rules, I might look at things something like hole to hole clearance or V to V or clearance, so 0.5 for hole to hole. So in here, I'm going to need to find the appropriate um, rules. So here, for instance, hole to hole clearance, and this is currently set to um, 10 mil. So I'm gonna to wanna to cancel this and then change it to millimeters to match GLC PCB, open up the rules again, and then I'm going to want to change this to um, the appropriate setting. So in this case, uh, our hole to hole clearance was five millimeters. So I'm going to want to go through and make sure that the values here, or sorry, 0.5 millimeters. So I'm going to want to make sure that the value here for all of these matches all the rules of, from JLCPCB for the capabilities so that I can ensure that my board ends up being manufacturable. So same thing here for like routing widths. I need to specify a minimum, a preferred, and a max width. So in general, our minimum is about 0.25. Our preferred is about 0.5. And our max is typically around... Um, around 2. So after going through all the rules, so again, that was just a brief overview of what you need to do. You go through every single rule against the capabilities on JLC and then set those. So the next thing we can start doing is routing. So initially, um, we're going to start routing our uh, traces based on our routing priority list. So our routing priority list should have been defined before starting this in terms of analog traces, digital communication lines, um, digital I.O. and power lines. So once that's done, you have some calculations for trace width sizing. So for instance, for here, for this trace, this is my power trace in this design. So I should have a calculation already done for my expectation for how much power this is going to dissipate because I'm going to need to know how wide to make this trace. So for instance, Four PCB is one of the recommendation recommended tools that I use. So let's just say, for example, sake that that trace is going to be carrying one amp of current. It's going to be on one ounce copper because that's our standard. Um, the, our ambient temperature, let's say, is thirty degrees. Our temperature rise, let's say, we're going to allow for thirty. And let's take a look at the length of this track. So Control M is the shortcut for measurement. So in this case. This is 457 mils long, so that's half an inch. So our overall trace length in this case is 0 0.5. And then this is the required trace width based on that current. So I need six mils um, if I'm only gonna withstand a 30 degree temperature rise, which means that overall trace getting up to 60 degrees Celsius. However, if I reduce this requirement to say 10 degrees, and now needs to be 11.8, or 30.8 for an internal layer. So the trace that I have specified here is 0.5 mils, which is essentially uh, tw 20 mil wide, a little bit less than. So there's my first trace coming through from my connector here through my filtering cap, right? So we want the power flow to be through our component into the connector. Ground will be one of the last things that we pour with the Polygon Connect. So I'll show you guys a Polygon pour at the end of the build. 
so we can continue our road here. So out of this, I'm going to then go through um, my C3 cap, which is the bulk filtering cap for my um, voltage regulator, and then C1 is the decoupling cap for my uh, um, microcontroller. And again, we want the current to flow through these. Now, a nice other rule of thumb that I like to do is I like to place a VIA right behind uh, any filtering caps. So if I press tab, once I have the uh, part selected, I can go over here and choose the net I want it to be associated to. So in this case, it's gonna be associated to uh, the net ground, because that's what I want this to be coupling. And then over here, I can set my hole size and my diameter. So in general, I like to say um, the hole size should be equal to the trace. So if I'm using a 20 mil trace here. Well, this should be a 20 mil hole with double the pad size, so a 40 mil pad. And now if I hit enter, I can resume routing. So I'm gonna place one of those behind each one of my ground pads for my caps so that they have a good connection to the ground plane. And then generally it's also a good idea to place it near uh, microprocessor grounds as well. So I've done placing my vias. Let's continue with our, our interactive routing. So let's take a look at some of the next routes here. So I have this route here from R4. Okay, that's the only way, only section it's going to. I also need to route U1 to U1 here. Oh, and if you look, I need to now route up here to R1, but I can't push through this. So that's a problem. I'm gonna to have to reconsider possibly how I do that. So let's take a look at some more of our routes here and maybe I can figure out a better routing pattern. So net U11, oh, that needs, just needs to go there. Ground to ground, that's fine. Net R4, where does this need to go? Oh, it needs to go down here. And net R1, where does this need to go? Oh, it needs to go to that chip. So maybe I can space these in a slightly better location here to optimize these routes. So likely this is some type of uh, voltage biasing, voltage divider. Um, I could go back to my schematic and double check my layout if I'm not completely familiar. So this is a nasty route here. You see how it does this jog. We don't like that in the design. It's gonna make for difficult manufacturing. So I'm gonna extend this out. I wanna come into my pad at a square angle, nice 45 into this pad. So that takes care of that route. And now I need to route these other two connections here. Now again, we see another five volt connection, so I'm probably gonna to wanna to move this chip to a more convenient spot to get this routed nice and easily. So again, a bit of print and circuit board design is coming up with a design and then finding uh, an improved alternative to it.
Now, the reason I modify that is I generally don't like when we have acute angles like this. So I might move it like that so we have nice equal angles here. Those are nice easy 90s or greater than 90s for the system to route. And just adjust that again so it's coming square into that pad. And again, I'm probably going to adjust this just so it's not quite so tight to that green LED pad. So I still have these two traces I need to deal with. I need to deal with red LED and green LED to actually get it routed over here. So now I could change how these parts are routed. Essentially, I could change the, the relationship between these. My other option is I could route this. So for instance, I can start routing this and let's say I can't get over here. I can't envision any way. Well, if I press the plus button, I now change layers and automatically a V is generated. And now I can continue my route and I've now routed my green LED trace. And let's just do the same thing with red LED. So I start my red LED, I press the plus icon which changes my layer from top to bottom. I drop my um, red LED. And now I have my two LEDs routed from the output of my op amp. Now there's better ways that I could do these, but I'm just showing this as an example. Okay, there we go. That's our first set of traces all routed, except for we still have to route ground. So now in order to route ground, you could also see that I could make this board far more compact or I could space these components out much further and have more room for routing and possibly eliminate these vias. But let's just assume for the moment that this design is actually acceptable. And let's go on with our process. So now what I wanna do is I wanna do a polygon pour and I'm gonna to go to, into the polygon manager. So here in the polygon manager, I'm gonna create a new polygon what am I going to create it from? So I'm going to create it from board outline. I'm going to connect this to ground. It's going to be on the top layer and I'm going to name this top ground. I then want to specify the smallest islands, i.e. what's the smallest amount of copper that I want it to remove. What's the smallest neck of copper that I also want it to remove. And we always want it to remove dead copper and we also want to pour over all same net objects. So now if I click apply, this is going to show me the, um, this is going to show me the polygon pour that's gonna be placed on the board. And we're actually gonna also wanna do this on the bottom layer. So let's just uh, basically create a new polygon from the selected polygon. And now I have the second one here and we're gonna relabel this bottom ground. I'm gonna change the layer on this to bottom layer. It's still connected to ground. All these rules are still true. And we're gonna click apply. And now I have uh, a pour on the top and on the bottom. So, There is my bottom layer pour, there is my top layer pour. And quite often the reason that we want to do both top and bottom layer pours is so that we have good connection between our components. So this is the first initial step in doing a planned circuit board design. After this, you'd go through and refine this. You might take a look at some of these routes and figure out better ways in which you could actually achieve this routing. You know, perhaps you're changing the arrangement of parts, you're rotating them, you're looking at ways to optimize it. Generally, if you're gonna do that, you're going to want to shelve the polygon pour because every time I go to move a part, I'm gonna end up getting a violation in here and it's just difficult to move and see where the parts are placed. Generally at this point in the design, the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is a design rule check. So this is going to check all the rules that you set up from JLC PCB against your design. So if I run the design rule check, it's gonna go through and it's now coming up with all the errors that I have in my design that I should fix, right? So I have a, a routing via issue, 
right? I'm violating the minimum and maximum hole size uh, because I didn't set up my rules properly. Um, I have a minimum angular ring issue. I have a minimum solder mask silver issue. Um, so the solder mask clearances. So I need to go through and fix all these errors before this board's gonna be ready for production. And if I click on any one of these errors, it takes me right to the specific parts that have an issue. So again, I'm getting a number of these errors because I didn't set up my rules properly from JLC PCB in the beginning. And I need to do that before I can send this off production because that is one of the first things I'm going to check on the design. So hopefully this uh, video tutorial was helpful in your PCB creation process. Uh, stay tuned for more videos on how to set up output files and check your fabrication outputs.